Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the show. You guys know the show. This is where I sit down with amazing humans and I do everything I can to unpack their brain with the goal of helping you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today is going to blow your brain wide open. He's one of the top adventurers in the world. He's a speaker across lots of different genres and he is the new I guess, New York Times best-selling author of the book, The Impossible First. My guest today is the Colin O'Brady. Welcome to the show, Thanks bud. Thanks for having me here. We love you. Great to be here, man. Yes, we made it happen. Thanks, India, for... Connecting us, Sarah, our friends that made made this happen. Very I'm happy sure. to have you on the show. Yeah. Um, and congrats on the book. Thanks, it man. Yeah, just, some lists. It's just, just came out two weeks ago. Just hit the New York Times bestseller list. Proud moment. You know, poured uh, my first book, but I poured my heart and soul into writing it. Um, so uh, yeah, it's nice to have it out out in the world. Amazing, amazing. Um, well, we got a lot of ground to cover because this, like, we just met 15 minutes ago. Yes. When you walked in the door here, um, I'm familiar with you and your work. And you know that our audience is primarily creators and entrepreneurs and every creation and every business that we build is an adventure. Mm-hmm. And so the parallels between the life that you lead, literally adventuring all over the planet, doing some crazy things, which we will get into, and the entrepreneurial or the creative journey that we all go on on a day-to-day basis, there's no mistaken that there's a lot of similarities there. So I'm going to want to unpack that, but we're going to also keep relating this stuff back to really tactical, tactical and actionable stuff for our audience. Um, but before we do this, let's go back to young Colin. Hmm. Were you always, was it curiosity that drove you? Did, was it in your blood? Was it in your veins? Um, or was there some event that made you want to seek uh, to see the rest of the world. Be yeah, you know, it's it's been an interesting path. Obviously, I guess what I'm most known for in the world is these adve- you know world record breaking adventures and you know being the first person to cross Antarctica solo unsupported and things like that. But uh, certainly in my early life, um, you know, I, I dared to dream greatly. I suppose you know aided by my parents and influence in that way. Um, but I wasn't really coming from a background that that was an obvious path. You know, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I was actually born just an hour south of here in Olympia. Oh, um, nice. Parents are big hippies. Went to Evergreen State College. There you go. Um, I was born at home on a futon with like a group of hippies hanging out at my parents' house uh, th- at this commune, basically. Wow. My mom playing Bob Marley redemption song on repeat. Wow. Like it that was, was her, pretty, like, like her giving birth song. Exactly, okay, that was amazing. a giving birth song. Um, so you know, not the the most you know traditional upbringing, um, but certainly you know I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. My parents moved from Olympia to Portland, and we didn't have a lot of money. They were young parents, but they were always like you know a the, the things we could do for free. Honestly, were like enjoy the outdoors. Yeah. Um, and so you know we'd go camping and we'd go hiking and mountain biking and things like that. Um, but also with this kind of like undercurrent of you know my mother always saying to me like you know whatever you dream of you can create you know whatever you know whatever you want to be in this world and just like you know I think that a lot of what's happening happened you know in my life and there's some elements I'm sure we'll unpack but have been from just that you know inspiration from being a kid um, and just being you know wrapped up in you know around like sort of loving positivity you know my parents divorced um, when I was pretty young but they still uh, you know brought our family together in what they call ohana the Hawaiian word for family the chosen family so we, we still have you know family events where both my mother and father and step parents and step siblings are all there you know breaking bread around a table so I think that sort of underlying sort of positivity and love you know played a big role. Wow. All right. So how does one go from camping with their parents to forging out on their own and starting to take risks? Was there, you know, was it as soon as you had time on your own, you started like distancing yourself from uh, the establishment and like most kids go into the movies on the weekend <laughs> and you're like doing the Pacific, you know, Crest Trail. No, like, it wasn't what? so much that. I mean, actually, I think the biggest, the biggest obvious break for me was so in, uh, you know, I graduated from college in 2006. Um, I was a swimmer in college uh, and went to Yale University. Um, and, you know, most of my friends had an economics degree. It's 2006, you know, Wall Street's crushing, oh, yeah. right? I grew up with barely any money. Actually, every summer I'd go home and paint houses with my buddy. But every summer, like, I'd be painting houses. My buddies would be like, getting these internships on Wall Street and get this. And I would just, like, kind of was looking at that life, at least for me. And that's not judging other people's. So I was just like, I don't know. Like, it's a lot of money, but, like, 
in a desk, I'm in an office, I'm in a big city that just doesn't like, you know, you know, speak to my heart. And people were like, you're crazy. It's such a good opportunity. And I was like, I was just like, I want to travel. I want to see the world. So every summer I went and like saved up, you know, enough money, um, maybe it's like a thousand or 2000 bucks every single summer throughout the end of high school and college and kind of put it in this like bank account going like when I graduate from college, like I want to travel and see the world. And so 2006 happens, all my buddies from college, you know, go off and get these Wall Street jobs. And I've got like 10 grand to my name and I take a backpack and a surfboard and buy a one-way ticket to travel around the world by myself. Um, and, you know, it was an incredible experience, you know, all told, you know, I had been, you know, I was living in youth hostels. I was hitchhiking around New Zealand. I had a surfboard. Um, I actually, on that trip, met... It's hard my- to hitchhike with a surfboard. Yes, yeah. it is actually. But you can't in New Zealand people are really For friendly. For sure, they are very <laughs> friendly. There's a few We're places like, you can do that. I can only but, really get in half the yeah, cars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the uh, but my I, I met my now wife on that trip. It was almost 13 years ago. Oh. I met her on a beach in Fiji. Um, Jenna, and you'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about her because it's a huge part of our business and our life. But um, you know, unfortunately, during that same trip, uh, tragedy befell me. I was uh, you know severely burned in a fire in Thailand. Um, and the book, the yeah, subtitle of the book is. Yep. Uh, you know, from fire to ice. And this was really kind of a, a big, obviously life-changing moment for me of, of tragedy. I was a silly 22-year-old kid on a beach in a party in Thailand, and I was jumping a flaming jump rope. And um, in Thailand, that's somewhat common. It's not like I invented that at Compsit, but the rope wrapped around my legs and let my body completely on fire to my neck. Um, and, you know, survival mode kicked in, and I jumped into the ocean to extinguish the flames, but not before about 25% of my body was severely burned. Um, and not just the physical trauma, but I'm in the middle of nowhere in Thailand. There's like a rural hospital. It's like a shack. There's a, you know, there's a cat running around my bed in, the, in this makeshift ICU. And I went under these surgeries and the doctors walked in after a few days. and They're like, look, you'll probably never walk again normally. Like you're like really badly injured. Sorry. And it was this moment of just deep, obviously physical trauma, but the emotional trauma of basically being like the totally. way you pictured your life being, you know, I identified as being an athlete most of my life and was yep. like, you're not that anymore. So think of your next dream. Sorry. And my mother came over uh, to my hospital room, you know, four or five days in, she kind of arrived. And um, I don't know if you have kids or not. Um, I, I don't have kids myself, but I hope to soon one day. And I can only imagine what it's like being a mother and, you know, your... seeing your kid in this place, like so helpless, this like dark, dingy hospital, all this. And I know now she was crying and pleading with the doctors for good news, but she never showed me that fear. Instead, she came into my hospital room every single day with this big smile on her face and just this air of positivity and daring me to dream about the future. And I think that that does connect back to entrepreneurship and creativity. And actually, my mother is an entrepreneur herself, and there's a lot of those values. And in fact, in the book, um, we'll talk about the adventures, but there's actually an entire chapter in the book which we call from whiteboard to reality, which is this concept that was instilled with me from my mother, which is like, she goes in this hospital moment, she goes, Colin, like your life's not over. Like you're 22 years old. Yes, you're in a real bad spot right now. But like, close your eyes. Like, what do you want to be in the future? It could be anything. Like, what do you want to do? This is in the hospital. This is in the hospital. And I'm like, mom, are you, I mean, come on. Like, I'm just hanging on for dear life here, literally. She's like, no, no, no. Like, tell me, like set a goal. And so I closed my eyes. And in that moment, I visualized myself probably because I thought of myself as an athlete throughout my entire life. I pictured myself crossing the finish line of a triathlon, which is not something I'd ever done. I'm a collegiate swimmer, but never biked or run competitively, nothing like that. So I opened my eyes and said, Mom, you know, I want to one day race a triathlon. And it could have, she could have easily been like, yeah, I said set a goal, but like the yeah. legs and diagnose. Yeah. I mean, like maybe something else. And she was like, she was like, she was like, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. The next day she gets a Thai doctor. Like you have this photo of this Thai doctor kind of shaking his head. And I've got these weights. He hands me these 10 pound weights. I'm like, doc, I'm training for a triathlon. I need some weights. I'm like, my legs are bandaged from the waist down. But I'm like, I'm training in my mind. I'm like, I'm going to do this one day or whatever. And my mother, you know, several months in the Thai hospital, flew back to Portland, Oregon. I'm carried on and off the plane. I'm in a wheelchair, you know, through this process of her like teaching me how to walk. Literally, I put in one chair in front of me, taking like my very first step. The next day she moved the chair five steps away. You know, I take five steps the next day. And this entire process, all the while imagining that bigger goal, which was finishing a triathlon. And we won't get too bogged down here, but fast forward 18 months, um, I finally did need to get a real job. I at least thought I needed to get by my parents' basement. Um, took a job in finance in Chicago in 2008, which is still kind of a crazy time to get a finance job anyways. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, timing is and, ominous, ominous timing. And she, uh, I signed up for the Chicago triathlon. 
And I end up, you know, 18 months after being burned, being told I would never walk again. I compete in the triathlon. I finish the race, which is my goal. And then to my complete and utter surprise, I haven't just finished the race, but I actually won the entire Chicago triathlon, um, you know, beating four or 5,000 other participants on the day. And it was this moment now, your initial question was about my childhood or what forged this mindset or what, you know, this yeah. creativity within me. And it was this moment where I didn't just like pat myself on the back. Well, I guess I'm just a great athlete. It was the opposite of that. It was going back to the Thai hospital in my mind, wondering what would have happened had my mom not forced me to look towards the future and set this measurable goal? Like where would life's outcomes have taken me? And it was in that moment that I realized, not myself, I'm not some like superhuman freak athlete. Like we all inside of us have these reservoirs of untapped potential to achieve extraordinary things, particularly when we can shift our mindset and shift them towards these positive outcomes and then dig into the hard work of actually executing on them. And so that has definitely been a, um, I guess a blueprint for the things that I've done. That was 12 years ago and the other world records and things I've done, which is, you know, now I call it now from whiteboard to reality. It wasn't, you know, in that my mind that, but it was like, what's the massive goal? Write it down as big as you possibly can. And then, okay, hang it on the wall so you can think about that massive goal, that entrepreneurial success, that huge exit or whatever it is you're driving you. But then go like, okay, like what can I do today? The chair. I can take the one step from my wheelchair to the chair in front of me. What can I do the next day? and stacking those stacking those bricks. So what you said a handful of things that I want to unpack and put a pin in and revisit over the next you know, 5 minutes here. The first of which is mindset. Now, your mom walks in and there's one thing that's like your mom's mindset and there's another thing which is your mindset and also former athlete went to college on a soccer scholarship. I identify as an athlete. I've also had some injuries where they said you're not gonna recover. So I, I wanna understand your psychology, your own psychology, your own mindset in that moment. You got mom coming in all bubbly. What was your true state there? Fear, so a, what, anxious, Yeah, when, excitement, I, think that, when like, I think about that moment, it's, a, it's a, like a precipice moment or a sliding doors moment where like, you know, the physical trauma is going to be there because, I mean, I've literally burned off all the skin and on my legs. There's some photos inside the book. I didn't put the most, most graphic because there are a couple where you're like, damn, okay, like you're very hurt. Um, so that's there. But there's a piece of that that, I mean, I probably wasn't quite this place in my mind, but that this too shall pass. Like I will recover in some regard. I'm not always going to be in this much physical pain. Yeah. But the lasting impact, and that's the precipice moment of who am I if I can't, run or walk or you know who who am i and that's that sort of teetering on the brink of this sort of emotional trauma which is ultimately a lot longer lasting yeah. if you allow it to be yeah. and that's where the mindset came in and my mother came in and in a lot of ways facilitated me overriding that fear that doubt because that was very much there very much bubbling up inside of myself yeah. um and you know i'm a big believer that we are the stories that we tell ourselves. And we get to choose the moments that are inside of our mind and inside of our brain. And again, I'm at the time, I'm 22 years old and I've had a lot more of experience that have reinforced this since then, but it's the beginning of this understanding of like, you know what, like I have a choice. Like I have a choice in this moment to actually program my mind for tomorrow. I can't change, I can't go back and not jump the flaming jump rope. Obviously if I could, I would switch that thing. Yeah. But in this moment, I am right here right now. I get to decide what happens today, what happens tomorrow, what happens the next day. And I'm not going to try to pretend like just a, a flick, a switch flipped and I was like, I'm no problems, whatever. It was a traumatic year. Yeah. But under the sort of guise or the my mom leading me down the trail towards the positivity and that mindset shift towards that versus the opposite, which is like the right. doctor said I'm never going to walk again. That's my new reality. Let me completely adjust to that. Depression, you know, yeah. fatigue, you know, exhaustion. And then that what are the compounding ripple effects of that negative mindset? Yeah. What were some like specific because just saying like I changed my mindset. It's it's less relatable and then and, and, and until you tell me a story or like what you actually did did you visualize yourself crossing that yeah, so line did you like you you talked figuratively or conceptually about putting a you know your big hairy audacious goal on a whiteboard and then looking yeah. at every day but tell me like how did you get from that dark hospital bed in thailand with your mom cheerleading but that you have to be clear you have to do a lot of work for sure. Beyond the cheerleading that your mom did for you. So what did it look like on a, like, were you journaling and visualizing, like, 
praying? Like what, what, <laughs> what, what, what I don't know what, what you did because yeah. there's a lot of people right now who are listening that are in a place that they don't, they didn't expect themselves to be for whatever reason, yeah. economic, social, personal health, otherwise. And we all want to crawl out of the hole when we find ourselves there. Give us some tactics. On so the process do. for me, and you can definitely apply it to the burn accident and recovering from that, mm-hmm. but you can also apply it to the other things that I've built and created in my life. And like I said, there's, there is a chapter in this book that's really about um, you know, creativity and entrepreneurship. As I've gone on and built these other world record projects with my wife, they've all started with a massive goal and idea. And most of them have also started from a place of like, we have no idea what the hell we're doing. So like when we set our first a huge massive world record goal project, it was like, I want to see if I can set the world record for climbing the seven summits. That's the tallest mountain each of the seven continents, going to North and South Pole faster than anyone. That's called the Explorer's Grand Slam. Great, great idea. Um, and we want to start a nonprofit because we want to have a bunch of impact and like with schools and kids and like all this kind of stuff. Like, oh God, that's a great thing. We had just gotten engaged at the time. So we're just kind of like riding high. This is 2014. We're like, yeah, we're going to have these big ideas. This is what our life's going to be like together and all this kind of stuff. We get back home. And we're like, okay, so we have literally no money. We're in a one-bedroom apartment. We have no money. We have no network. We have you know, 200 Instagram followers. We have no reason that a sponsor would ever like, invest in us. We have no idea how to start a 501c3 nonprofit. Like, there was a moment of like, we're going to do this big thing. And then we, the reality, we get home, we're like, yeah, but like, come on. Like, what are we actually going to do? It's that moment you're describing the other people. Like, going, like, yeah. They're in a moment right now of going like, sure, I have a big goal. But yep. like, what the how the hell are you actually gonna do that? What's my first step, right. second step, eighth step? Yeah. And so for us, in that moment, it was this moment of like, this is the moment where creativity or innovation die. It's like you have a great idea, but you're like, oh, like I mean, maybe it's not me. Like I could read about the guy or look up on Instagram the guy who actually did the thing, but like yeah. I'm not that guy or that girl, right? And we're like, well, we have no idea how we're gonna do this, and it's gonna cost half a million dollars, and we have we have like ten grand saved up or something like that. So we're obviously not writing the check ourselves. We're like, but you know what we do? We have an internet connection. Google, this is a true story. One of the first things we did, we wake up in the morning, we write, Google, what is the difference between marketing and PR? That was our first question in Google. Now, fast forward to today, my project Crossing Antarctica yeah. had two billion media impressions. It was the most viewed uh, you know, expedi- live expedition ever. I was also, a year after that, I was the first person to Snapchat from Everest, and that had 22 million views on social. So what happened between Jenna and I Googling that shit and that happening, <laughs> right, right. which was, and what it ultimately boiled down to is a daily practice of waking up and be like, I have no idea how we're going to do this. We called like five people who we night thought might know a friend of somebody. Then we called five more people. Like in the book, a year down the path, we still were hundreds of thousands of dollars short of this goal, but we woke up every single day ferociously being like, how are we going to build this? How are we going to create this? Who can we talk to? Oh, we learned something else about how to get our nonprofit you know, certification through this. Okay, that's one more egg and you know, drop in the bucket. I'll tell a story from the book, which I think is relevant to the entrepreneur's audience, which is we asked hundreds, I don't know the exact number, could have been a thousand people for help or funding getting our project and idea off the ground. It's like, we're going to set this world record project, but the larger idea is to build a media campaign around it that has a ripple effect of positivity with this nonprofit impact with kids. And people were like, okay, that's kind of interesting, but like, what, like, what are you going to do for me? Or what are yeah. you going to show? Literally hundreds of people said, no, no, no. I mean, we've heard, I've heard no so many times. It'd be the same thing as just pitching angel money for your tech app or sure. whatever that is, right? No, 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 no. And each one of those no's, like I got, of course, more and more and more and more discouraged. However, what I also got was I practiced my pitch. Every single time I got no, it was like one more rep of being like, no, but tell me about your idea. You know, it started off probably this like 10 minute rambling. Well, there's like these mountains and there's this, this and like impact, like whatever. And then like, you know, better. Polish, more polish, more polish, more polish. And I tell this story in the book on this kind of like how did Jen and I build and create this? Because some people said like, well, it's great. You've walked across Antarctica and you've climbed Mount Everest. You've done these things. But that all like takes a ton of money. I'm like, look, like we did not do this with money. We did this because the perseverance that we you saw in the mountains and the climbing and the you know, 10 world records I have or whatever, like actually before any world records, the perseverance was actually getting this idea off of the ground. For sure. And so... A buddy of mine, we've raised like a piece of the money, but we're still hundreds of thousands of dollars short. And I've started to take interviews and I'm leaving from in six weeks. And Jenna looks over me and so there's nine expeditions of this Explorer's Grand Slam. And she goes like, we're going to run out of money after the first two expeditions. But you've already like told people that you're doing this. Yeah. And you've, I've started speaking at schools because we actually started the nonprofit part of what we were doing. Okay. 
but we're just like still like we're gonna find a way we're gonna figure it out a buddy of mine he says to me he goes hey Colin um I want you to meet a friend of mine she set a world record um and I just think it'd be a cool for you to meet someone who has a world record because you're trying to set your first world record and uh come to this spin class at this local gym by our house and I was like a bro a spin class like I'm a professional athlete like I'm not gonna go to like a group fitness class on like yeah. a Sunday and he's like seriously man like come with you first of all it's actually a pretty legit workout and like just come and so I was like okay fine like kind of like thought I was a little too cool to be in a spin class turns out by the way I freaking love spin now like it's a <laughs> legit workout I did my first soul cycle class the other day there super fun but get in the class I get it I get in the class and he introduces me and he goes hey um you know this is my friend Kathy um you know woman probably you know 20 years older than me but she's super fit she's already like cranking on the spin bike she's like super strong and fit and she's like oh hey like nice to meet you and she's like yeah you know she had the world record for the um 5k back in the you know the 80s or something I remember when she was in college and I was like oh damn like a legit runner like I was like super cool to 5K meet you 5k is a hard distance yeah, to like, run that fast exactly for sure. exactly the 400 the 800 the 5k yeah this is like so brutal. brutal I'm brutal. like okay like that's right. cool like legit and so now I'm kind of like I'm in the spin class so I'm like, like damn pain. like yeah. yeah you're 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 badass so she's like and my buddy's like my buddy Angela says you know tell her tell her what you're doing and so I've gotten no a thousand times at this point yeah so I've just got this I'm not I'm not pitching her she's like a, just a person in the spin class and so I just give Telling her my tight story, yeah. my 30 second pitch it's not pitch, but it's just like the story that this is yeah. what I'm doing. Here it is. Right? Retrospectively, it was polished because of all the failures. Yeah. But I wasn't thinking that at the time. I was just like, I told any person over beers or a coffee or a random networking event or this, this story, right? She's like, oh, that's cool. That's amazing. Great. Boom. Spin instructor walks in, starts the spin class. We start spinning. It's 90 minutes of spin. I get my sweat on. I'm like starting to think, okay, spin's kind of cool, but like, okay, random. Cool to meet this woman. Actually, it was pretty inspiring, like whatever. Walking out of the class, like, hey, Kathy, like really nice to meet you, like whatever. She's like, no, 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 come here real quick. Um, uh, my husband's actually in this class as well. Um, hey, hey, tell, tell him what you're doing. And I was like, okay. And I just like. Pitch number 1008. Yeah. Here we go yeah, again. Right. You know, here it is. So I'm doing this thing. I'm climbing these mountains. My wife and I started this nonprofit. We're impacting kids in this way, blah, 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 like whatever. And he's like, wow, um, that's a really cool. Uh, are you like looking for like sponsors? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I actually think uh, the company I work with could, um, could, could help you out. I'm like, of course, I'm like, you know, antennas yeah. up, right? I'm like, great. Um, like, do you have like a business card or like whatever? And he's like, yeah. Mark Parker, CEO, Nike. <laughs> I'm like, oh, the company you work at might be able to help. <laughs> like, and so the the essence of that story, of course, is we failed a thousand times. But a, you never who know who you're talking to. In which case is like. I was just as passionately talking about my idea because I love it, not because I had no idea I was talking to, you know, a Fortune 10 CEO, yep. but I was also talking to the woman in spin class. I was also talking to the barista at the coffee shop. I was also talking to the person on the street because I freaking was so excited about what we were trying to do. Yeah, you can't, there's no replacement for like passion and energy. You just exude that stuff, right? It just like runs out of your pores. You just be like, I want to do this. People smell it too. And then the second piece of that is... We kept going. There's, you know, one of my favorite, you know, uh, allegories, the book, the Al you've read the book, The Alchemist? Of course. Yeah, one of my all-time favorites. And I, I quote it in the book as well. And it says, you know, we often die of thirst when crossing the desert just a few moments before seeing the palm trees on the horizon. And it's, you know, I, I use the analogy in the book when I'm like, almost wanted to quit this 54 day solo thousand mile journey across Antarctica pulling a 375 pound sled. But the, you know, the entrepreneur's tale is just the same. same. Like, I was like, dude, I'm not going to a stupid spin class. Like, come on, like, I'm like this. I'm like so stressed. My project's not gonna work. I've been working on it for however long and it's just gonna fail and like all this kind of stuff. And it's like, actually, one last thing, one last meeting, one last, you know, chance, serendipitous encounter stacked on top of your thousand failures that lead to you being polished and passionate in the right moment that you need to be Made brings to life that and of course there's you know a number of other things you know have happened since then but you just never know yeah and i love that to me that is the part of loving the process and loving what you're talking about what you're doing rather than just the you want the end goal of being able to ring the bell of i did the seven summits i crossed the antarctic i did whatever your big dream is to me that like getting other people excited about what it is that you're doing you know i, I call it building community around your ideas and that's how 
wickedly underrated that is because if you've got your own dream in your parents basement like how how likely are you to achieve it nothing happens in a vacuum nothing happens solo you walked a thousand miles solo or more, slightly more just than in, that just, uh, just, just under just under okay yeah. but how many people were a part of the community that made it possible and the truth is so the I always say this, like, it's a shame that it's just my name on the books, on the cover of the book. Um, and my publisher actually the other day, you know, a book published two weeks ago. I'm in New York, you know, kind of like, cheers, you know, the book's published. And he, uh, my editor pulls me aside and he goes, publish a lot of books, Colin. I got to say, you might have the record for the longest acknowledgments that anyone's ever written in a book that I published. And he was, you know, wow. kind of ribbing me and joking around. Yeah. I was like, that's because, like, the irony of this story is that, like, you think this story is about a man walking by himself 932 miles across Antarctica, something no one in history had ever accomplished before. And the truth of the story and what the truth of, is in the pages as well as the truth right. of the acknowledgements is right. it actually was a success of a huge community of people, a huge number of mentors, influences, family members, dreams, failures, successes, learnings, wisdoms, yeah taken from a large community of people yeah. that ultimately ed led to that moment. And I also like what you said about enjoying the process or the journey. You have to. Not giving up, giving away the book itself, because of course I want people to read the book, but I actually end the book a quarter mile away from finishing the goal. As, and there's an epilogue after that, but as a testament to the point of writing the book, also the point of making the Antarctica crossing was not to have the moment when I touched the finish line and had my hands in the air like, I did it, no one in history yeah. has ever done it. The book is actually about myself, a relatively young man, learning throughout the totality of the journey and experiencing the ups and downs and the yeah. hardships and the fears and the doubts and the euphoria yeah. and the love and the gratitude and all of these things. It's not about, and see, the crescendo of the book isn't, and then I did it. It's like, yeah. that would be... A flat note at the end of what is actually the the sort of the essence. I like the the essence. I think is a really good way of capturing it. So, let's talk a little bit about like the actual adventures. We talk, you know, I think a little bit of background is also helpful. Your um, your injury is substantial. Like that's that clearly played a huge role in setting you up for this. Was there anything else before we move forward? Is there anything else childhood or um, any part of your upbringing that contributed to your desire to set these records and to live the life that you're living beyond that, the experience of the I mean, the other, the other thing is we'll definitely get and get in the adventure, but the other thing that I think is apropos for this conversation is I watched my parents build a business when I was a kid. So when I was 13 years old, my parents had worked in the natural foods grocery industry for a long time for other people. Mm -hmm. um, like they were hippie farmers that ultimately got a job at the local co-op, that yeah. ultimately got a job as like clerks in the grocery store, and then ultimately you know worked their way up into the management of the grocery store. And in 1999, when I was uh, 13 years old, uh, freshman in high school, I guess, um, my parents said, hey, like, we're actually going to take a swing here and start our own, you know, grocery store. Um, and it's a grocery store chain in, in both in Portland, I guess, it's spread out now um, called New Seasons Market. And they... Just had one here in yeah, Seattle. Yeah, there's one in Seattle now. Um, my parents haven't been involved in it for several years now, but um, that's their business. And they started it. And what ultimately happened was when I was well out of the house, well after the burn accident, all this kind of stuff... It was financially successful. Like this is a successful business. They, they've sold it. They, they've done well for themselves. Like it's a great thing. My childhood had, there was zero impact of sort of the financial success of their business on my childhood or the way that I was raised. But the impact to me was actually far greater than that, which is our dinner table conversation from age 13 to 17 was about my parents building a business. And not that I mean, sure, it's about business, but actually them being like, we have a dream. Okay, what's the dream? It's a mission-driven business. Okay, what is a mission-driven business? A mission-driven business is, it is a for-profit business, but we believe that we're going to make a community a better place by creating this business. Well, how does that work? Okay, well, it's a grocery store chain. Well, we want local farmers and fishers to have a marketplace to bring their stuff to. And the people that are working in a grocery store, oftentimes at large, you know, chain grocery stores, like, don't have health care if they're part-time employees, don't have, you know, good benefits, they're, you know, paid low wages. We're going to pay them high 
higher wages, we're gonna give them health care, we're gonna all these things. Ultimately, there's thousands of employees in this, but that was just their dream in that moment. So I watched my parents from the dream into the reality phase and yeah. not really the reality into exit phase of, of yeah. their thing. Yeah. And that creativity, although I didn't want to start a grocery store, I watched my parents scrape together every last penny on an idea that they firmly believed in. And they talked about it as a family business. It wasn't like, yeah. we're going to work and we're not talking about it. It wasn't like they just berated me with like, you know, spreadsheets every right. night. Right. But like as a kid, I was aware of them building something yeah, creating and the something. incremental successes and the incremental failures along the way. And so that seeped into my blood in my own way. And I've actually a few years ago, um, I talk about it a little bit in the book, I'm at Burning Man, I'm sitting there at Burning Man, and I'm looking up at this you know, amazing piece of art, and myself as an athlete, I never thought of myself as an artist. I was like, an artist is someone who can like draw super well, totally. or like take a really amazing photograph, or something like that. Like I'm obviously not an artist, I'm not creative. I'm staying there with Jenna, and we're looking up this art installation, everyone's playing and dancing and interacting with the piece of art. And I was in that moment, I was like, wait a second, we take ideas of nothing, turn them into something, but we tell the stories of me going on these adventures so that we can have this ripple effect of experience within schools, within corporations, within anyone following on Instagram, the stories we tell, like, wait a second, yeah, what odd, we're doing- Oddly similar. <laughs> this it's is the same thing. exactly the same thing. We yeah. are artists. Yeah. And what my parents were building in their entrepreneurial venture, like in its own way is this Absolutely. creative process, this art, I'm actually getting you know, chills just saying it. And yeah. that was that mindset shift for me to reframe on the last person over the last 30 some years to say like, you know what, I'm an artist. And a couple years ago I was like, wait a second, like what we are doing is a very creative expression of living life. And the other people are dancing and interacting and playing with it and then taking from that, hopefully creating their own inspiration. Like I wrote this book Definitely not so that people can read my book and be like, wow, Colin, you're a true badass. You walked across Antarctica by yourself. Like my hope, and I called the impossible first, and that's what we called the Antarctica project itself. So someone will set this book down, put it down and be like, my impossible first is this. Like the worst return on investment for this book for me is when I get a DM from someone that's like, dude, you're awesome. The best return on investment is someone goes, man, I read that book, it was gripping, edge of the seat, the storytelling was amazing in this. And like, I'm finally like this thing I've been putting off till tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Like I put your book down, I'm like, I'm doing that thing today. Clearly it is like, A, it's a page turner. B, it is inspiring anytime you watch someone live their dream and you can just feel your energy for the things that you've done. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to I want to explore some of those things in yeah. particular because it's some crazy shit. So, um, and I also, my background is as an action sports photographer. I don't know how much you know about that, but all the climbing, ski, snowboard athletes in the world, I've worked for all the brands, done all the stuff. Uh, and usually in, in sort of a storytelling fashion, but I'm just close enough to a lot of the people in your community um, to understand and know the, the um, hardcore aspects of these feats, but the people who actually do and live those things is such a small, small, narrow group of people. Everest, for example, the Seven Summits, um, this project of uh, just how we say piloting a boat across <laughs> a very dangerous body of water, yeah. like, A, where do these dreams come? Hey, let's talk about a couple of these individually yeah. and then while you're talking about some of them, help us understand how does one come up with this particular challenge? The Seven Summits yeah. is one that right. is, is not new to you. Right. Um, so that's a little bit more obvious, but you should also include that for the folks at home who don't know much yeah, about so it. Yeah, so it, you know, it's an interesting progression and I won't stay too long in one place we can keep the conversation flowing, but the, the Seven Summits Explorers Grand Slam is something that's in the zeitgeist of the adventure exploration community, what do you call that? And so my first big project, the one that we talked about that I was trying to raise money for at the very beginning, with no kind of background in this, that's me saying, other people have done this and I want to do this thing faster than it's ever been done before. So I'm not racing anyone side by side, I'm kind of racing history, but I'm repeating what's been done. So the seven summit, the tallest mountain, each of the seven continents, that's an established thing. Yep. So I go after that and I'm, I'm successful with that. And the next project- How did you decide the order to climb in? 
based on really based on weather, yeah. like just the conditions of the weather and like where to kind of slot them in. Year yeah, and how fast exactly. Year. You have to start in Antarctica because it's Antarctic summer, and you can only climb Everest in the second week of May, and so that sort of dictates a few you know moving yeah. parts. And there was a couple of things you could switch switch around, but there wasn't that much variance. Once you really look at it, you're like, yeah, eh. I climbed Elbrus in winter, which is traditionally kind of summer, but that one I feel like I could handle in winter. Whereas yeah. like you're not gonna make a winter ascent of Everest in a project like this. Like, <laughs> right. So there's a few things like that. So after completing that. Then I did another world record project, which was called the 50 High Points, um, which was really the first piece of like, I would say like collaborative art piece uh, expeditioning. Sure. We were always sharing the story, but so this ends up be doing it. This was one we allowed people to participate in. So I climbed the tallest mountain in each of the 50 US states um, and faster than anyone has ever done that. So 50 mountains, the tallest in each state. Um, the record before it was 42 days and managed to do it in 21 days. Um, but wow. the bigger sort of the time. Bit excitement around that was after talking to like students and school kids all around the country, I talked to kids in like, you know, the East Coast or in Florida or something like that. They're like, that's cool. We're talking about mountains. But first of all, like, I don't even live anywhere near mountains, let alone go to Nepal or like climbing Kilimanjaro or all this kind of stuff. And I was like, man, like there's amazing outdoors. I don't care across this entire country. And so I want to do this project that kind of exemplified that. And sure enough, the tallest mountain in Florida, by the way, is like a 350 foot hill on the side of the road. So I had to go like tap that hill. But we did this thing we called the Forrest Gump effect. So on social media, on my Instagram, we were like live tracking where we were and invited anyone to come out, like come to the trailhead, hike with us, climb with us, meet us on the summit. And we had thousands of people meet us all across the country and touch different parts of their project, climb their home state, explore part of their state they've never been to, yeah. all this kind of stuff. So that was super fun. But then this was all around the similar moment in time when I kind of had that epiphany at Burning Man about creativity and art. And what does a true artist want to do? Well, in my opinion, I guess, a true artist wants to create something that's never been done before rather than re repeating a record that's been yeah. in a way that's never been done before. But it's your so, own independent individual artistry yeah. exactly yeah. and so that's when my mind started like you know being curious about not just a world record but a world first something that had never been done before and the my last two projects but with the book itself is about becoming the first person in history to do this solo crossing Antarctica um, solo unsupported so unsupported means no resupplies of food or fuel so I had to carry everything with me the entire time so I was dragging what started out as a 375 pound sled basically yeah. packed with food and then fuel for melting snow into water um, and uh, it, uh, several people have tried it before me over the years you know one guy made it 900 miles and died you know just 100 miles from finishing after 71 days another really you know famous explorer um, you know made it 50 some days and ran out of food and had to you know get, get flown out of there because he was going to run out of food before continuing the crossing and it basically was in this like kind of question of like the reason we called it the impossible first is people were like there's a lot of quotes before I tried it that was like this crossing's impossible like the math equation of like how much food, supplies, how much you can actually, because if you had a thousand pound sled, it's a ton of food, you'd never be able to move it the first yeah. day, right? And so it was kind of, that was the question. And we called the impossible first, quite frankly, and I think this is, to me, I think this is a lesson for any entrepreneur, was we called the impossible first because we thought this might actually be impossible. But is that a reason not to try it? Because what I've learned when I've set audacious goals or I've stepped so far outside of the comfort zone, like stepping outside of your comfort zone is where you grow. So I fundamentally yeah. believed if I attempt this thing and put my whole heart into it and I still can't do it, I'm not, it's not going to be like a, just a net loss. Like, oh, well, that was a huge waste of time. It's like I'm going to learn something in this process. And if I do push beyond that and actually prove it to be possible, even better because it can you know, show others what the boundaries of their yeah. own sort of limiting beliefs. And so that was really where the idea was conceived or that art piece of saying like, what has nobody ever done? And Jenna and I you know, built out this project with the you know, train for it and all the things we needed to do with the intention of attempting to do this thing that no one in history had ever done before. The Some details about that. So I'm super good friends with Mike Horn. I yep. don't know if you, you probably yeah. know, know Mike and he's done a lot of, he's done the pole to pole right yeah. now, which they just got across. He the, just did that incredible, like, and through the through the like darkness to the North Pole, yeah, like North this is, Pole in winter. In the winter, like That's I actually posted about it on my Instagram yesterday, today, yesterday. That's I was bonkers. like. You know, I was like, look, I'm getting a lot of praise for things I've done in the polar reaches and all this stuff. Like, if you want to know the guy that just did the most hardcore badass project of all time, yeah. like what they just did, him and Borg Ausland yeah. in uh, the winter of the North Pole, it's like, I mean, it's, it's... Like how many days? 56 days with no like, sunshine. No sunshine. Average temperature 70 below. And I've done a much, much, much smaller expedition to the North Pole, just the last degree of latitude. Mm -hmm. Antarctica is very tough. 
and you know, minus 30 degree ambient temperature, I'm out there alone, all this kind of stuff. But North Pole, it's crazy because it's a floating ocean. And even in my short expedition out there, I found it to be incredibly hard because all the ocean, basically the, you know, they, the ice flows crack into each other. And so there's these pressure ridges. And so you've got this heavy sled, but you're also like taking your skis off and like throwing it over like the ice cracks. And you've got one, the, one of my expedition out there, one of the guys I was with fell through the ice into like, you know, freezing water, I had to pull them out, but then it's minus 30 degrees outside. I mean, it's just, it's a hectic place. So imagine doing that in winter for yeah. two months like dude hats off to, to those guys do, like swims and water yeah. crossings and hardcore is all hardcore yeah crazy yeah, yeah. crazy hardcore yeah um <clears throat> i think a lot of i think mike also is one of the guys who did the crossing but with under kite and skis. exactly yeah and that's very different than what you yeah so, done, so the in distinction and Unfortunately, there's been uh, you know a small debate where people are like I don't understand like Colin you're you're claiming a world first but you know Mike Horn or Berger or Auslan you know 25 years ago did a full crossing solo, and they absolutely did and what they did is sure. remarkable um, and like I'm, I'm, like I said I'm in full deference to their accomplishments. The difference is they were propelled by kites, which yeah. is considered assisted. Yeah. Um, and what I did is unassisted. just, it's called walking. unassisted, it's just called walking. walking. And <laughs> what the, I did and is I, called walking. And, and the two of them would probably look at and be like, that's called dumb. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's like, <laughs> that's why would like, you not, why do, would you not do this? Yeah. Um, but it's honestly, in, in, the, in the truth of it, it's just an apples to oranges type of thing. Like they're just, it, it's just, it's like the difference between rowing a boat or kayaking versus sailing. Like yeah. both are awesome. They're just, you know, they're apples and oranges types of things. Um, and so they were, they with kites have been able to cross in even further distances of Antarctica. Um, I was able to cross the entire Antarctic landmass. Sure. Um, so from the edge of the Ron ice shelf via the South Pole to the beginning of the Ross ice shelf. But in Antarctica, there's these frozen ice shelves, which is basically frozen ocean. And then that extends. To, to the water um, and so I, I, I crossed the entire mass of the actual there's land underneath yeah. but I stopped at the ice shelves whereas they with kites were able to do the crossing and I'll go all the way beyond as well so again see, it's super my, cool my point for raising this is all these definitions and the subtlety a it doesn't take away from the actual experience right and B as you said like this is individual creativity and if it's apples to oranges someone's using a kite and you're using a sled and walking like to me, this there's so much sort of anxiety and like, oh, I don't want to do this because it's already been done. Or you have your own lens on all of the stuff that you're doing. And ultimately, if you're not doing it for at least that reason, it can be that reason and other reasons, but if at least that reason, then what are you doing? And to me, in you know connecting with your book, that is such a powerful and consistent lens that you seem to see the world with. 100%. Jenna and I, in all of these projects, and you're actually kind of like the dream phase of like how we think of these projects, what we want to do. And one of our sort of core litmus tests in doing that is we ask ourselves, if you could tell nobody about doing this, would you still want to do it? Yeah. Right? Such a great lens. You know, and it's like when you, when you sit in that and you're like, heck yeah, like I am personally curious about the experience of being alone for 54 days in this harsh place and the deep learning and the fear and the overcoming obstacles of that journey, like I want to do this. Or like, do I want to? Yes, I want to, you know, climb the seven summits because I'm just always dread about those mountains when I was a kid. Even yeah. better if we can do that and have impact at scale and share that story and inspiration and all the yeah. other things that come from what we actually do. Yeah. But if you don't have it in its essence, if you're if you're looking at the other lens, which is like, I would never in a million years want to do X unless I was going to get paid a gajillion dollars or Become I get this accolade or, or I get this famous or I get this like, you know, oh, New York Times bestseller next to your name, you know, whatever these like the, you know, external success things. Like yeah. if that's what you're doing it for, like stop now, like just just stop. And you, you said it in a different way previous, which I liked, which is sort of the exuberance or passion like when you I'm sure in your life in Silicon Valley and all the things like you've sat with young entrepreneurs and you you can just see the difference when For the sure. guys like lit up about this widget or that widget and it does this and you're like For you're sure. like you're fired up about it. like or versus like I came in here and I'm supposed to say the thing to the guy and the For guy sure. and he could write me the check for the and you're just like there's a difference in those two things so crystal clear and it it leads to the actual execution because the guy who's like all not passionate he could even have a better idea than the dude who's or I shouldn't say dude female woman whatever who's passionate about it 
And that passion is gonna override through those hard moments because when it gets super hard, when I'm in the middle of Antarctica pulling a 375 pound sled and I'm all alone and I'm starting to get frostbite on my cheeks and like all the crazy things that happen in this entire journey. Like if I was like, man, I never really wanna do this anyways. Like that's the moment like I pull up my satellite phone. I'm like, yo, like come pick me up. (laughs) Out. But like right. I kept grinding because on a personal level, yeah. away from all of it, you know, like I said, we turned this project into something that had two billion media impressions. I had no idea of that. Like Jenna never told me that. The only person I had contact with during it basically was Jenna, my wife. And that was like safety and medical checks and emotional kind of stability type of like check-ins yeah. essentially. And it wasn't like I was like, hey, like, are we crushing it on Instagram right now? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, are you alive? Are, do people think this is cool? Like that yeah. is not what's going on. Yeah. And that's my point. If that's the things that are driving you, it's great when the things, your passion that you're living lead to all of those other things yeah. because then it is a totality of like, wow, this is awesome and I can also support my family, my life, my dreams and things like doing these types of things. Yeah. But if you're, you're doing it the other way around, it just, to me, it's probably going to fall flat. Yeah, and you can like, you can feel it when it comes from the right authentic place and when it doesn't. Like, yeah. You're just around people and that is, you know, if you're the average of five people you want to spend or you spend the most time with, like, to me, there's not, you can't replace spending time around that real authentic energy in whatever, whether it's the stock market or adventure or anything in between. Well, you started off the conversation by saying like, hey, you know, the there's a lot of parallels between adventure and entrepreneurship. Yeah. And like, I would take it even one step further, which is to say like, there is a lot of parallels between people living their passion and their truth in any vertical. Like love, family, creativity, entrepreneurship, adventure, art, you know, whatever that yeah. is, you meet somebody who's into their thing, you're it's, like, damn. It's infectious. Yeah. Like, whatever it is, it could be like, uh, like vintage cars. Totally. Yeah, and but if someone's like, like you're yeah, like, yeah, I'm yeah. like, I'm listening. Yeah. Cool. Like, it's not my thing, but like, totally. damn, I love being around people like that yeah. personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk about your recent crossing. Yeah. So, um, this is bonkers. Right? <laughs> so, Obviously, I'm always kind of looking at different ways to create, different ways to kind of stretch different muscles. And we talked about mindset at the top of this interview. And to me, I always say, you know, people are always asking me like, oh, this sled was so heavy or this. And like, you know, sometimes people say when they meet me, they're like kind of surprised. They're like, you're like, uh, I'm not trying to say this the wrong way, but you're like kind of like a normal size dude. Like they're expecting like, you know, like, (laughs) you know, exactly. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm like, okay, and I'm not offended by that at all, by the way. Um, But, you know, one of the things that I often say is I think the most important muscle any of us have is the six inches between our ears. That that, in the end, is learning how to flex and develop that muscle is so important. We talked about mindset. But I wanted to take it one step further in my next, last, next project, my last, now my last project, (laughs) my next project after Antarctica, which was just a month ago, I... Decided to see with a team of people this time. So rather than being solo, exercise the muscle of sort of a group dynamic. So that's a whole other interesting layer for sure. Um, But also in a discipline that I have never done ever before in my life. And so no one in history has ever rowed a boat, rowed as in rowing like this. With an oar. With an oar. No sail, no motor, nothing like that. But rowing a boat across Drake Passage. So from the southern tip of Antarctica, all, sorry, so in the southern tip of South America at Cape Horn, across Drake Passage to Antarctica. It was about a 700, give or take, mile journey. And the Drake Passage, for those unfamiliar with seafaring, is known to be the most dangerous ocean passage in the world. It's the convergence of the Southern Ocean, the Atlantic, and the Pacific. And, you know, commonly 30, 40, 50 foot swells, icebergs. The ocean is about, you know, one degree Celsius. So it's basically practically frozen Slush, cold yeah. water. Um, you know, you've got whales and dolphins and penguins and, like, you know, all the kind of you know, cool, but interesting wildlife, you know, out there. And basically you're battling this crazy ocean. Now, I set this goal with this group of other people. But the big kind of caveat for me um, was I, up until about three months ago, had never rowed a boat anywhere in my life. Like, I've not, like, not, I wasn't like a collegiate rower, which some of the other guys on the trip were. I wasn't, um, I've never, you know, even, like, rowed a boat across, like, a lake on a family vacation. Like, I've never <laughs> rowed a boat anywhere, ever. I've never been open water sailing. I've, I've been, spent some time on, you know, a few boats and things, but sure. never on any sort of, like, long seafaring crossing. And certainly nothing that I was, like, captaining or being, like, you know, uh, an active participant in in any capacity. And so... The thought experiment with that is, but what have I done in that? That seems so different. Like I've never done this thing before. But I'm like, well, actually, what have I done? 
I've pushed my body in really intense and in, in ways. This is going to require rowing the boat constantly. So it was, there were six of us on the boat, but three places to row. And so it was 90 minutes of rowing and 90 minutes of resting. Consistently, the boat had to move 24 hours a day. So we we're never getting more than 90 minutes of rest ever at an entire time. And the cabin is like tiny. It's an open hold boat. The boat itself is 29 feet long, about four feet wide. You can check it out on my Instagram. We posted every single day from it. Um, and kind of shared the story live as we always try to do through satellites. Um, tiny little boat. I mean, in short, it's a tiny, like spending six dudes like in this tiny little, just like space with right. us. Like inside go. this cabin, like there's, you know, visit me, like I'm literally curled up in a fetal position. Like that's the like rest time. And so it's full on. But wait, I've actually pushed my body hard for long durations of time. I've done that in cold places. I've actually even done that in Antarctica before. The only thing is I actually haven't done it on the ocean. And so it was a question for me, can I apply what I've learned in my learning and then stack a new discipline or skill onto that. So rather than looking at something and going, oh, rowing, that must just be for the rowers. Because how many times in our own lives, in any discipline, have you gone and been like, oh, like, I'm not a X. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a math person. I'm not a creative. I'm not like, that's just not my thing. But a growth mindset, of course, says like, I might not be that right now. Like, I actually do not know how to row a boat. I know nothing about that. But I know how to train my body and I know how to train my mind. And you know what? Like, I have a pretty good Rolodex of like great athletes around me. Surely one of them knows some good rowing coaches and people who could train me up for that and like whatever. And so, like, I was like, let's do this and dove headfirst into the training and the preparation. And ultimately, last month I finished on Christmas Day, but with those six guys we were successfully the first people to row a boat across drake passage we did battle a lot of 30 and 40 foot swells and insane moments and absolute craziness um, which was one thing that was cool was we filmed the entire thing and through partnership with the discovery channel and the discovery channel is going to put out a feature length documentary um, about the whole row we called it the impossible row so that'll come out this spring Um, but they also did these little mini episodes you can check them out now like online if you want to like see the entire journey but it's like it's full on like we are like battling the ocean in an insane way um but uh it's it, was, it was an amazing the yeah ocean is, is yeah start to like see that stuff firsthand and it's bonkers yeah right? and it's also one of those things where like the curiosity of course in my mind goes to outdoor places but i was like i've ex- you know i still continue to climb mountains throughout my life i love the mountains i love the forests i love the deserts and this and i was like ocean like i've done a lot of i've done a lot of surfing in my life my dad lives in the north shore of Kau- Kauai now and He's an organic farmer over there. So I spent a lot of time swimming in the ocean, stuff like that. But I was like, never been in the open ocean. Like that's like most of this planet is actually open yeah. ocean. Like I want to yeah. go check that out. And what better, I guess better, but they're kind of think of better ways. But what more interesting way than to see it from this tiny little rowboat that's, you know, floating just a few feet above the water. But uh, it was a wild, wild, wild adventure. But it was really cool. And we talk about storytelling a little bit um, here. One of my biggest passions is still finding interesting ways to even share it even more visceral and more in real time. Yeah. And uh, well, with this partnership with Discovery, we were able to kind of invest in the satellite technology and it kind of had a, a three-part sort of content stream around it, which I thought was really cool, which was literally through Instagram every single day, I was able to post videos through the satellite, um, which like, you know, people are sitting around on Christmas dinner, like with their families and they're like, turn on my Instagram and here I am like jammed in this rowboat and there's like icebergs flying around. They're like, oh damn, I'm glad I'm not out there <laughs> right. right now. Uh, be sitting here uh, with this turkey. Exactly. <laughs> and then, like I said, they were able to chop that up in real, relative real time, a few days delayed, but put out these like kind of five to seven minute little like mini, what they called mid form episodes. So those went up like relatively live, which was cool. And they're teasing on the channel, but then there's also this like two hour feature length documentary that's going to go through their whole channel. So it was kind of a cool, um, I, I have, my heroes in exploration have been the heroes of a century ago who went out for two or three years, yeah. no one knew where they were, and they would return back with this like crazy story in their journals and maybe a, a grainy image or two. Um, but in today's age, you know, as much as like I do see the negativities around, you know, social media and things like that, there's been certainly times with you know, mess with my brain and things like that. I can also see the obviously beautiful power of being able to share stories at scale the way we, we have been. And yeah. so it's been fun with my expeditions to embrace the moment in history or the timeline of the world that we are in and say that technology exists. So let's find more interesting ways throughout it 
to use that to amplify. And that goes into the classrooms of the nonprofit work that I do. It goes into, you know, people's homes and things like that. Again, with the same explicit reason in that I, you know, that I wrote the book is not to be like, yo, I'm the athlete in the arena, check me out and do this crazy thing. But through the lens of like exposing people to like, whoa, oh my God, that is a penguin jumping by the boat. And that's Antarctica. Wow, we maybe we should preserve these beautiful places in the world that still exist. And or like, that dude never rode a boat before. We're like, and I'm complaining about like, <laughs> not I can't run my local 5k like next month like yeah. okay maybe you know what like maybe i can do that speaking of heroes i love that you broke that topic who are some of your heroes and what role did they play in where you are now it's a good question i you know obviously when I'm, my mind goes to like there's like a couple of different buckets there's like historic like heroes like people who are no longer living or i've read books about you know there's uh you know like ernest shackleton is a, a name if you're in polar exploration or even not that most people recognize from the history books certainly sure. a hero of mine in the kind of pantheon of exploration um and then to me there's the people who have like truly touched my life on a personal level who are you know not like famous people or anything like that but i write about my first grade teacher um shannon pinnell um, I read about it in the book, just a short little vignette, a couple paragraphs, um, but a nod to, I was a rambunctious kid. I have, you know, I have five older sisters. I'm the youngest in my family, um, a lot of energy, the only, you know, the only boy raised in my household. And my, this teacher, my first grade teacher, who I ultimately had actually coincidentally first grade and then fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, oh, wow. kind of she like moved up in sort of the age of teaching at the same time I did coincidentally. And I was bouncing off the walls. And we all know this story of kid bouncing off the walls. Like that's a that's a kid that that needs to be medicated or that's like a troubled kid or he's he's bad because he's this. And what she realized it's a super basic thing. She was like college just needs to go run around outside. And so like kids would have recess and the school fortunately had like kind of a little more leniency. She would like every so often be like Colin, you know, go outside with the assistant teacher. You're going to run around. You're going to run around the schoolyard for like 15 minutes and then come back inside. And it was that simple. The difference between dictating my life towards like Colin actually is really engaged in his schoolwork after he runs around for 15 minutes. And there's I mean, there's a million examples of a teacher that didn't take that or like see that and be like, that's a trouble kid. Send him to the principal's office. I can't do this. He's disturbing this or whatever. And she was able to find a way to channel my energy and put it towards that. So when I look back on my life as the influential people or heroes and then like from a, you know, a current day, you know, answer to that. You mentioned you're a soccer player. Um, Megan Rapinoe. I mean, That's Amazing. a hero of mine right now. Just like com- com- never met her, don't know, know anything about her, have no interaction with her ever. Just from watching from afar, like what a hero, what an absolute legend, legend. Um, in the way that she carries herself or her message, her poise, her grace, her determination as an athlete just across the board. So, um, How about the historical? You mentioned Shackleton. Yeah. Others that are explorers that are from our current current time, current space. Yeah, I mean, we talked about... inspiration from elsewhere. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, you, you talked about a couple of them already, you know, like Mike yeah. Horn and Borga. I don't know yeah. either of those guys. Um, there's been people in articles have drawn comparisons between us, and yeah. I, I even kind of shy away from that because, you know, they came a couple decades before me, ultimately, when they're kind of coming up and when they've done, they're still doing prolific things, but they've been doing it for a long period of time. Yeah. And, you know, there's guys that, those are guys that I've, you know, when I'm training for my project, you know, read their, his, you know, historic accounts and sure. things, things that they've done. Um, um, Alex, you know, Alex yeah, a free solo. Yeah, course. what Alex Honnold did a free solo. I mean, I think to me, Alex is a really great example. Um, what he did in the sport of climbing is extraordinary. I mean, unquestionably to yeah. free. I mean, it's insane. Gangster. But I yes, actually so think, gangster. in my opinion, and this is not just because I inhabit the outdoor community, you know, in some capacity. I actually think what he did for human performance is actually one of the greatest of all great human achievements, just period, like far none. Um, Like forget the outdoors, forget even sport, forget that like a true mastery of craft. And when you hear him talk about memorizing all the moves and all the steps, it's like, to me, it's like composing like a concerto or a symphony. It's it's, it's a dance, it's a mastery of your mind and body. It's like a true full expression of the human experience. And so, yeah, I mean, what he's done is is extraordinary. And to me, you know, and, and another, you know, modern example, is you know Kipchoge breaking the two the two uh, the two hour marathon record um, or this year? It's like that is the stuff that I love to see. And what I love to see about a Honold or a Kipchoge is also their grace and their poise. Like I am doing this, and this is so awesome. 
But like, I'm certain that if somebody free solos El Cap or free solos El Cap on a harder route, or somebody five years from now runs a 158 marathon, like Alex Honnold's gonna be the first guy cheering on that other dude, as well as Kipchoge is gonna be like, heck yeah, like I broke the two hours and now this guy broke 159. Like the people that I've met at the true top of their game or people that I've observed at the true top of their game like that, generally are not the ones going like, I did this, I'm the master of this domain, no one else can do this because I'm the guy who did the thing. They're actually like, I did this because I was like super and I cannot wait to see what the next generation comes up with to push this Recent example, Kobe, RIP, just passed away this last week, attending that week, LeBron beat exactly. his record. Heck yeah. And uh, yesterday, uh, I'm spacing on her name, but a female soccer player, athlete from Canada, just beat Abby Wambach's all-time male or female international soccer scoring record. Yeah. The first people to comment are these greats. Yes. And that's such a really, really interesting. It says so much more about um, the character of the person rather than just they're great at their sport. There's yeah. this, this an, a 360 degree human, almost as you put it. Um, part of that, like, first of all, on the Alex's achievement, I agree. And it seems to me that there's this resemblance, this like 360 degree view of life that you're referencing in other people, but clearly that you have this in in you. And how is it that you envision the next great adventure? Like clearly there's a 360 degree story. You've mentioned it several times. You talked about nonprofit, kids, awareness, media impressions, storytelling. Like it's it's more complex than I think one might gather on the surface. Was it A, was it always that way? And B, how do you think about your next thing? So A, was it always that way? And B, how do you think about the next thing? You know, I think just like in everything, I see the whispers of it always being this way and that like, I'm not like, oh my God, how did I get here? Like we did this thing. It's like we mapped it out and envisioned it and also pivoted and changed and all along the time. But like with the same, the core principles have been the same. Yeah. That said, like, We've learned a ton along the way, yeah. you know? Totally. And, you know, one one great example of that actually would be when we first started our nonprofit, what we thought was, let's raise money. And when we raise money, let's give it to other nonprofits who are doing space in this work. And this was the first nonprofit we partnered with was an organization that was doing really great work with combating childhood obesity, which, by the way, is still something I'm, like, really passionate about, you know, fighting the good fight for, raising funds for, et cetera. But as we like went through that phase and you know we had a really ambitious fundraising target like we didn't quite get there. You know, we didn't quite get there with our fundraising target. But what we way over indexed for was awareness and impressions and the the impact of the storytelling and then the personal stories that were then reflected back to us like we either read this about you or I saw this video content and this changed this or this entire classroom had this impact here or whatever. And that's when we went like, "Oh, it's not that we we're gonna be like, oh, raising money is stupid. We're like, oh, what our impact with our skill set and what we're doing is actually a little bit better served if it's redirected, reoriented 25 degrees this way, which is actually in the programmatic side of actually executing on taking the storytelling and building STEM curriculum around it and doing that. So it's a it's a, it's a tiny little micro example no, of saying example, of saying like the why and the purpose and the impact we wanted to have as actually the through line's been continuous. Yeah. But the delivery of that was like, oh, like, oh, we learned something from step one to step two, and then from step two to step 10, it's been like slightly refined over time. So we are different in what we're doing now than we were five years ago, where I was but 10 years ago. that's like iteration, right, in the entrepreneurial mindset. 100%. Like you're, you're just experience. And most people I find, they wanna see the whole staircase before they start to take one step. But I think you're, what you're saying here, if I'm misinterpreting, tell me, but the, the, the journey continues to unfold as you're walking. And it's 100%. probably no different than, um, than some of the things that have happened along the way in your, in your it, journeys. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, and certainly in the expeditions, and I, you know, I've spoken a lot about Jenna because it's truly her story as much as it is mine. And she's not just like the support role, like cheerleader, like, yeah, go. I mean, she is in the details. This is her Logistics, full-time job, yes. dialed, like focused on all the things, all the different parts of what we're doing, the creativity of it, the business side of it, all this kind of stuff. But one of the things she always says to me, and, and there's a small little, again, vignette in the book when we're talking about kind of backstory of this, is she's like, she's like, Colin, like basically like you're trying to 
push this domino down and have this domino effect of all these things cascading out. She goes, the one thing I can tell you is that the first domino is not going to hit the next like hundred and they're all going to be like perfectly aligned. She's like, there's going to be a domino effect, but the one, the one thing that I can guarantee is our plan is not going to go to plan. Right. That's the one thing I'm sure of. And if you reframe your mind around that into an entrepreneurial sense or whatever, there's a whole lot of power in that because A, you're not surprised when things don't go your way. Yeah. It's not to not have the plan then. It's not to like at least try to map out the staircase, but to be like, oh, it didn't go exact way. We were ready for this and we can adapt in that moment. And yeah. so much of the success of these projects, like the first moment that I'm out there on the ice in Antarctica, I, I pick up my sled to pull it and I can't move it. Like I, I straight up actually cannot pull a 375 pound sled on that day with the depth of the snow and all this kind of stuff. And I start crying. I start straight up crying. And the second chapter of my book is called Frozen Tears because when you cry and it's minus 25 degrees outside, it's really pathetic. Like your tears actually freeze to your face. It's like the all time most pathetic feeling ever. Like I told the whole world, you know, thousand mile journey across Antarctica alone and this and whole other thing we're probably talking about, we're probably won't talk about, there's a whole other, there's a guy end up racing head to head out there and like, he's disappearing on the horizon. Like, and I'm like, like, good shit. It's like, like a cartoon. I, right? I can't like pull the sled. And so I pick up the phone, I pick up my satellite phone and I call home to Jenna and she's like wondering if she knows all details. She knows I just started, of course. And like, she's like, why are you calling me? And we had called our project The Impossible first, right? And I was like, yeah, babe, um, I think we named our project the right thing. She's like, what? And I'm like, it looks like it's impossible. Like I actually can't pull my sled. Um, and I have this kind of like, you know, introspective moment that I write about in the book where I'm like, how pathetic is this? Colin O'Brady announces the world, the impossible. Like I thought I could fail in this project. I actually didn't plan for failing one hour into this project. I was like 30 days I might run out of food or I might break my leg or I might, you know, something crazy might happen. My tent might blow away in a storm, you know, whatever that is. But like hour one, day one, you're like, damn, Done. that's really embarrassing. Done. And what Jenna says to me in this moment, still flying away. Exactly. You're like, You're like, here, can you, I'm actually, I, uh, Ill, completely ill prepared for this. Oh God. So Jenna says to me, and to me, it, it's something that I've stuck with me, and certainly applies very broadly. Is she knows that I've got my GPS, which has these waypoints that marking. I'm mean, like, I'm navigating with a compass, but I've got these waypoints that I can like, you know, direct my way through the route. And she goes, she knows the first waypoint is very near the drop off point. She's like, Colin, how far are you away from the very first waypoint? And I like, I'm like, look down at my GPS. I'm like, ah, it's 0.54 miles. I guess it was a million miles. She's like, so you're a half a mile away from the first waypoint. She goes, forget about the thousand miles that you need to go. Forget about Lou Rudd, his name of the other guy who was, you know, attempting the crossing at the same time. Like he's disappeared off the horizon. Like forget about Lou. Yes, he's more prepared than you. Yes, he clearly can pull his sled and you can't. Like forget about that. Do me a favor. Make it to the first waypoint. Just get to the very first waypoint. Like you'll at least feel like today you did something, like you said, the staircase. You at least stepped up the first. You can't see the rest of the staircase? Fine. Get to the first waypoint and then we will regroup. And so I, sure enough, I was like, I somehow managed to pull my sled another half a mile, set up my tent, get inside for the first night. And we get on the phone with Jenna and she's already retooling the idea. And she's like, hey, we were already cutting it close on your rations. Um, but the only way to reduce food is to basically reduce your rations even more, which is taking more risk, but we're not giving up on this thing. And ultimately the net product, you know, two things happen. One, she's like, you need to get rid of five more days of food, which is like, you know, it was 20, 10 kilos or something like that, 20 pounds, 22 pounds. And I was eating, I was living off 7,000 calories per day, but I was burning 10,000. So every day I was already on a 3,000 calorie deficit. Wow. And she's asking me, now get rid of another five days worth of food. We'll figure that out down the line, which does have some consequences much later. I won't give that part of the book away, but it does have a compounding effect. But in this moment, she's like, if you can't pull your sled, we can't get to day two. So we need to solve day one. And day yeah. one is we need 20 pounds off that sled. You got to leave five days of rations behind. And fortunately at that first waypoint, there's other planes and stuff that land in that area so we could mark it so that we're not like littering Antarctica and digging a hole, bury it, and they're going to get it. So further on, you actually can't just like chuck stuff out of your sled anyways. It's like the last moment to make that decision. Um, so we make that decision. And that's, that's a strategic moment. And then there's also, we'll go back to the mindset, there's also a mindset moment, which is like, I went out and I failed on day one, miserably fell flat on my face, horrible moment, literally frozen tears on my face. 
And the next day, my alarm goes off after my first night in Antarctica. I wake up, of course, I'm still completely alone. I'm not looking out to the endless Antarctica abyss. And the first thing that floods through my mind, what happens? Fear, doubt, shame. All, all of the things are coming back like, oh my God, is this a bad dream? I couldn't pull my sled yesterday. And what, even with the 20 pounds, what if I can't pull my sled up? They're just like the rabbit hole up in your mind. Sure. And this is the moment where I said, like, I get to choose. Like, I am the story that I tell myself in this moment. Like, I get to control my brain and my thoughts. And I've been a big fan of mantras throughout my entire life. But I've never said this before ever in my life. But I just sit up in my tent and I yell as loud as I possibly can. I go, Colin, you are strong. You are capable. You are strong. And I, like, don't really believe the words that I'm saying. But I'm trying to override that negative, you know, feedback loop in my brain. Obviously, I can go through all 54 days. But... Day two, I say the same thing the first thing when I get up. Still don't really believe it. Day five, Colin, you are strong, you are capable. By day 10, by day 20, my body's exhausted. I'm starving. I'm losing weight. I'm starting to get frostbite on my cheeks, my nose. Every day when that alarm went off, I know I got to pull my sled 12 hours a day, five more hours of chores. It's a 17-hour day. I was never able to take a day off because if I took a day off, I would run out of food. I would not complete this, this crossing. I would lose the race, all of the things. And so when I woke up every single morning, alarm went off, ding, Colin, you are strong, you are capable. And setting the tone for that emotional shift, but going back to Jenna going, we don't know what day two, day three, day four, day this, get to the first waypoint, make an adjustment, then we can think about day two. At the end of day two, we can start thinking about day three. And that's how we built this. It wasn't solving all 54 days at once. It was solving them one at a time and starting each one of those days with that positive sort of, you know, surge and men's mindset. Scariest moment on one of the seven summits. <sighs> mm. I got, I have actually a good moment that I've, I, I've sort of talked about at some point, but it's a very long time since I talked about this story. So I am Mount Elbrus, which is the tallest mountain in uh, Russia, but the tallest mountain in Europe. 18,500 foot mountain, I decided to climb it in winter. And uh, I'm about halfway through the project at this point, so, you know, four, four or so mountains uh, through the project, and um, we're flying over to Russia, and actually it looks like there's a huge snowstorm coming in, like just super, super brutal snowstorm that's coming in the next day. And um, I climbed, I didn't climb any of the mountains with all the same people, I climbed a couple solo, but I also had different people like join me for like different, like like a buddy climbed with Donali with me and someone else climbed Karsten's Pyramid, you know, if that makes sense. And so I'm over in Russia with a friend of mine, this, this woman, um, she's actually Russian, and uh, we're going over there and we're flying in, we're like, man, we have to like climb tonight or this mountain's going to be shut down. And she goes, she's like, okay. She like has some local comments, like, but none of us know the, neither of us know the route. And if it gets whited out, it's going to be super sketchy. And we're just like fighting, like all the things are stacking of like how you make a mistake in the mountain. Like you're fatigued. You don't really know the route. You're rushing it. You should probably wait a couple of days, but the weather's so unstable. So you're kind of trying to thread this needle. And I was like, so I was like, do you have any friends or like any people in this town who like, cause she's from this area who like has climbed this mountain a bunch of times. Who we just like come with us. Like, why not? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll call up a friend of a friend. This guy shows up. Don't I don't remember his name. This guy shows up. Russian guy doesn't speak any English. Seems super friendly. She speaks Russian. They're talking. He's like, oh, blah blah. I've been up here, you know, a hundred times. Like, no big deal. Whatever. Um, this will be great. Like, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna weather's gonna crap out tomorrow. We're good. Great. Start climbing. Start climbing through the middle of the night. Common practice in mountaineering. Alpine mountaineering. Climb through the night. The conditions are better before like stuff stable. starts melting. More stable. When we divide the gear as we're leaving, he's like, I'll take the rub. Okay, you take this. We're dividing up the group gear. Also common practice, divide the weight like between us. And we've got skins on. So we're going to skinning uphill with, you know, skis walking uphill. And we start going. And the first part of it is just like this long sloping like snow slope. It's the middle of the night, super windy. It's probably, you know, wind chill minus 30, something like <sighs> it's a brutally cold. It's Russia in winter, <laughs> right, right? right? And oh. <laughs> at, at high altitude. And then we're going and we're going. And I kind of get in my own rhythm a little bit. And I'm, on, I'm in the first one going and all this kind of stuff. I'm going up, going up, a couple hours in. I look behind myself and I see one headlamp, probably like maybe 100 yards behind. And I'm like, Where's the other headlamp? That's weird. So I keep going. I look back, so I stop. My friend, she comes up to me, and she's like obviously been in her own little zone, like cruising along. She's a super strong climber. And I'm like, where is he? She's like, what? She looks behind herself. Nothing. No one there. And we're like, 
He's, got a, he's got a third of our gear too. That's super weird. <laughs> and for the first second is, is he all right? Yeah. But then we're like, wait a second. We're the two that don't know the route. This guy's been on here like hundreds of times. Not only that, like the terrain we were just on isn't dangerous. Like we were not on a place. It was like, it's actually like the top of a ski resort. The first half is like part of a, you know, part of the edge of a ski resort. And then you finally get up onto like glacier terrain and all this kind of stuff. Like that is so weird. Like where did he go? And so it's like blowing, it's windy. And we're getting freezing sand. The only way to stay warm in conditions like this is actually to keep moving. So we got this decision point. It's like, do we go back and like start looking for this guy? But then we both are like, nothing could have happened to him. It just doesn't make sense, whatever. And I'm like, he's got a rope. He has our rope. We are not doing this without that guy. <laughs> and so we look at each other and it's this, it's a, it's a risk calculation. And honestly, it's maybe not the smartest decision that I've ever made, but we're going, okay, I need to climb this mountain in winter, but this massive storm, which by the way, does blow in the next day and dumps like a hundred inches on the first day. Like it just shuts the mountain down for like a couple of weeks. Like climbing this mountain in winter, it can just be straight up shut down. Like it's winter, massive storm system can come through. It's not like, oh, it'll be good in two days. And if I don't climb this, it's stacking against all these other things. I'm trying to go from mountain to mountain to mountain faster than anyone's ever done. And that means that you have to like get up and down and not get delayed for like weeks at a time, basically. Yeah. And you know, North Pole's next and Everest next. It's like, it's ratcheting up like the intensity of this. I'm like, I kind of need to climb this today. Like, there's not like a knot. But if we don't keep moving right now, like, it's over. And not only is it over, we're going to be in this Russian town for two weeks and then miss the window on the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I'm like, do you want to go with no rope? <laughs> and so we make the call to actually climb without a rope. Um, like I said, which is one of the things where, you know, solo balancing glacier risk. travel. So solo glacier travel. So yeah. we get to the part that's consequential. And for those at home that don't know, like usually rope yourselves together. So if someone falls in a crevasse, the other person can rest so that you don't get stuck. And exactly. Yeah, uh, on glaciers. But exactly. Side, side note. That's, that's why a rope is valuable. Yes. And the other, so that happens. We get on the glacier and sure enough on the glacier unroped, I punch through a crevasse knee deep one leg but it's like hanging in there and like we're in a crevasse field we're unroped and we're making we are now making like the mistakes that you make before you really hurt yourself yeah, get into trouble like get into trouble um and i won't tell the rest of the story but you asked what's the scariest moment that's the moment when you're like all of these things are compounding i was exhausted i was tired we're trying to thread the weather window probably shouldn't have been on the mountain anyways kind of knew it so we got this other person because we figured that might like help us but that actually made it worse because he took the rope and it turns out he just like turned around and you know again I'm not trying to call him out but my friend she's like a five foot two Russian woman and she's like a pretty very badass strong person and I think it was one thing for me to be going faster than him but I think what ultimately happened is that she was also charging up the mountain Kicking and the us, yeah. the ego was a little bit like and so he's like oh my thing broke and I had to turn around and we're like Dude, you don't turn around when you're carrying someone's rope in the middle of the night on the mountain. If you're going to bail, fine, but like yell ahead and hey. be like, hey, like, <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> uh, so that was brutal. So that moment of being up on this glacier, but you either have to go up or you have to go down. You are in the middle of a glacier and there's no rope coming to you. So it was still this moment of like, you know, what do you do? And ultimately we did, we did actually get off the glacier, which we thought was a safer spot. When we got to the safer spot, we actually felt more comfortable and we we're like, well, up from here is actually, strangely in that moment was like just as good as down. And so we went, tagged the summit and came back down and, you know, obviously lived to tell the tale. But it's one of those moments where you look back and you're like, I said to myself when I'm doing this project, I'm not going to take any extra risk that I wouldn't on a normal mountain. And the truth of that moment is certainly learning this is early on this expedition career was like, I made a really risky call because I was pushing against this world record and like it's not a call that I would recommend anyone else taking in this moment. Like I'm like, even now, seeing like I said, I haven't told this story in a really long time. Like, like, that's like Russian winter mountaineering and you decide to walk around on a glacier without a rope. It's like not a, not a super good call. Um, and it was super scary, obviously. But I think that's like, we all have that in us all the time and it happens and we make calls that we know we shouldn't. And yet there's something in there that is powerful and right. And that is our instinct. Yeah. And like reconciling those is you do a great job of telling these stories in the book. And um, last sort of line of thinking before we let you go. Um, there are people out there who want to do things and 
very, very consistent thing in the, you know, in the creator or the entrepreneur sphere. I'll just say in the human sphere is fear. We've got this multi-million year old organ in our brain. It's not there to keep hmm. us happy. Its job is not happiness. We have to, you know, program it uh, on our own accord for happiness. Its default is a negative bias for survival. And fear, if you just label it one thing, fear is the killer of dreams. Hmm. And obviously reading your book is one way to help, to help <laughs> solve this and, and, and burn it. But what on a daily, very, very basic level can you advise somebody to play through their fear? What can you tell them on a regular daily basis? Because you've spoken and coached and written so much about this topic. Give someone at home who is trying to play through something right now a tool. So for me, um, and I, you know, I said it before here, which is I think the strongest muscle, the most important muscle that any of us has is a six inches between our ears. But I'm gonna go a step further with that, which is to say, if I said to you right now, talk about myself, like you're like, well, how'd you pull a 375 pound sled? People go there pretty quickly. You don't have to know a lot about sports to be like, well, I'm guessing you like lifted a bunch of weights at the gym and like got a lot stronger and like got bigger and like all this kind of stuff, which is 100%. That is exactly what I did. And so I'm going like, you're talking about fear. So ultimately you're talking about something that's happening within your mind and how to control that. Well, do you want to make your mind stronger? You need to take your mind to the gym. It's actually, it's really obvious and intuitive when you say that way, people are like, wait, oh, like there's actually a practice that goes into making this like stronger. Cause I think some, for whatever reason in the physical body, people think it's like, obvious. oh yeah, you gotta kind of gotta work out. You know, on the mental side, people are like, wait, it's exactly the same. You gotta take your mind to the proverbial, you know, mental gym or a tool as you call it, um, you know, what, you know, to leave, leave someone with a tool. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I can talk, I'll speak to what's worked for me cause I think it's a great, it's been great for me, but it can be a lot of different things, you know, visualizations or mantras or meditation or, you know, mindfulness or breathing or, you know, there's a lot of different like ways to access that, you know, awareness practice through yoga, whatever. Yeah. For me, the biggest kind of change moment, and this does come back to fear, but it goes well beyond that, which is just a mastery of mind or an awareness over mind. Because ultimately there are fears, there are actual real fears. Like you said, our brain is programmed like saber tooth tiger outside yes. of the cave, like get yeah. up and start running. Like yeah. there's still real fears like that. Like we're sitting in here in Seattle, you're in California and the, the earth starts shaking. It's like, man, there might be an earthquake happening. Find like cover. let me like, yeah. yeah, find cover. Like that's still, so fear yeah. is good in, yeah. that, in that sense. But I think what you're talking about is fear of starting, fear of beginning your idea, fear of taking a risk because you're fear of failing. Judgment. And then judgment. Yeah. And then there's an even weirder one, which I'm sure you've seen in the world of Silicon Valley, is the fear of success. Once you've actually built on something and now you're fearful of actually being the guy who did the thing. And like, sure. that's like fear has this really crazy, bizarre cycle to it. How to master that, what I've found at least my practice in doing that has been through meditation. Um, so are you familiar with 10 day silent Vipassana meditation retreats? My wife returns today from one in uh, Castle, uh, Castle Rock. You, I'm, I'm shaking your hand because you were a lucky man. <laughs> Because she's, it's, it's, she's done two a year or so for the last five years. Yeah, so this I is mean, one in the Vipassana traditional tradition that is not too far from Portland. Just amazing, outside, and she gets home today. I just fantastic, to like an hour beautiful, ago. beautiful. So, so you've done. So Vipassana. yeah. So you know, for those you know who have don't know what that is or whatever. So ten years. That's for high fiving my wife. Like, yeah, like it's me or something. <laughs> no, like, but I'm also that, saying, no, I and get you it. must have a great relationship with your wife because she's true. so you know. Oh, dude, I know. And, and, <laughs> I take credit. I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm the stay-at-home dad when you like go on these big adventures. Like, I got you. Yeah. So, <laughs> ten years ago, I'm racing triathlon. So after after winning that Chicago triathlon, I went and quit my finance job on a Monday and became a professional triathlete. Which, by the way, is not like the NBA or MLB. It's like you're more, making hundreds. It's like more of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, just sleeping on your buddy's couches type of deal. Yeah. But like, I'm at least doing that. Um, and you know, I wasn't, you know, doing a job that I wasn't passionate about and that's where this all started early on in my career. I'm racing. Actually, I'm in Washington at a, it was a, a international event, but it was, um, outside of Seattle actually. And a friend of mine, um, he comes to the race and he brings his wife and his wife's this uh, Turkish woman named Eche. And she comes up to me after the race and she's like, you know, like I'm not really into sports. You know, it's not like my thing. I'm like came because I'm your friend. I'm, you know, I'm married to your buddy basically. And she's like, but I can see on everyone's face that there is like a lot of kind of intensity. She just says to me, so like, 
what's, what's the practice for making your mind stronger? Obviously, this is a physical expression, but ultimately, this is all up here. And it was this really awkward moment for me. Like, I felt like I was, like, caught with my pants down. I was like, yeah, like, you know, like, I visualize stuff sometimes, you know? And I was like, God, like. What, what am I saying? Yeah, like, <laughs> I was like, I don't have an answer to this question, you know? And it was just one, like, was, like I said, like, an embarrassing moment because someone's like, wait, you're a world-class athlete. You're attempting to be a world-class athlete. And, like, you're telling me you're not actually, like, training your mind in, like, a real way. And I was kind of like, humbly, I was like, shit, like what do you suggest? And she was like, oh, well, for me, she's like, I would suggest these 10 day of Vipassana retreats. Um, and you know, there's the different, different forms of the ones I went to are 10 days, no reading, no writing, no eye contact, complete solitude. Um, other than when you're meditating in a group hall, but no one's talking to each other, no one's looking at each other, etc. cetera. Um, and they're completely free to go. Anyone can go. There's 270 centers or something like that all around the world. So no matter where you are, you're probably within a few hours of one. She's like, just sign up for one and go. And now me, you probably take this from this interview in some regard, which is, I'm like, well, I've never meditated a minute in my life, but I'm also like a dive head first in the deep end. The same guy's like, I've never rowed a boat. Let me row one across Drake Passage, obviously. is like, right. all right. Like, I've never meditated for a minute in my life. 10 days of silence completely by myself. Like, let's go. Was it one of the absolute hardest experiences of my life? Bar none, for sure. Sitting there in the stillness, I always say in the quiet, whether that's in Antarctica or on a meditation pill, like it's like throwing a party and all of your angels and demons are invited. Like the good stuff's in there, but like the dark and the traumatic and that fear, exactly yeah. where this question originated, like that is in there. Yeah. But that also sitting there in the awareness practice of Vipassana, which is ultimately just observing your body for as it is, it's like as basic as basic gets, yeah. allows you to go, oh, I'm afraid right now. Huh. You can take that objectively and not let that thought exactly not like that, like ratchet up your fear response or the things that you want to react to and all this. And ultimately, so you're not basically living this life of just this like reaction to this moment or that moment or fear or joy or craving or aversion or that, the other thing. And so I've gone back and repeated those 10 days, you know, several times, um, try to get, you know, every year, every other year. And but of course, what that ultimately does is jump starts the actual daily practice, which is the real work. Yeah. which is the consistency of doing that. So if I was giving somebody a tool out there who's listening, I would say dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org. I do not, this is a free thing. I don't get like a referral code or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, just for 99 yeah, exactly. There's nothing like that. But I would say to me, that has been the greatest return on investment for me personally um, of anything that I've ever done in my entire life um, by far. And that is definitely has it made me a better athlete, definitely has it made me a better high performer. Could I have gone in Antarctica for 54 days without training my mind in a meaningful way for years and years and years to get there? Absolutely not. But what it's also done, and I always joke about this, I'm like, I went there to be a better athlete and like, sure, maybe it did, but like, that's like the 10th most important thing it did. In general, it made me more empathetic, more connected, more vulnerable, a better husband, a better son, a better friend, a, you know, all of those things. And those are just a true lasting benefits that, yes, are going to lead to maybe your entrepreneurial success or higher EQ and things like that. But ultimately, just the general inner peace of happiness of having that, which is a way of understanding those fears. Do I have fears all the time? Sometimes people ask me, like, you must not be scared of anything. I'm like, I'm scared all the time. But I can sit there in that fear and be like, is this a real fear? Do, is this an actual, is this an earthquake happening? Do I actually need to duck for is cover? Is there a saber tooth tiger? Like, yeah. Or like, oh, okay, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little outside my comfort zone right now, but that's all right. Remember every time you get outside your comfort zone and you push through that? Like that's actually where you've learned the most. That's where you grow the most. Like, okay, lean into that fear, embrace it. One more time on that URL. Dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org, Vipassana meditation. There's centers, like I said, all around the world. There's one, uh, the, the one that I go to, I've gone to several, but the one near here is halfway between Seattle and Portland and on Alaska, Washington. Um, and uh, it's a uh, it's game changer for sure. Completely free. It'll cost you nothing but 10 days of your life, which you'll definitely never regret. Wow. The book is The Impossible First. Congratulations on hit the lists. And... Um, more so just being able to share your story with the world because a lot of people have done a lot of crazy stuff, but um, your ability to share that and help other people tap into their ability to find their own passion and dreams and pursue them is clearly what sets you apart. So thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Other coordinates, if you want people to find you on the internet, what's the best? Yeah, the best, I guess, is uh, 
Instagram, social media, I'm at Colin O'Brady on Instagram, Twitter, all the things. Um, come say hello. I uh, Like I said, I love to share all the expeditions there. Um, Jenna has set her, she took to me and she goes, last year she goes, hey, you know, my Mount Everest, my next Mount Everest is actually to climb Mount Everest. So Jenna and I will be returning to Everest, me in support and service of her reaching that goal. We'll be Amazing. coming from the north side uh, this spring. So if you want to follow that expedition, uh, we'll be, you know, kicking that off here in, in a couple months. Um, out on Everest, I've never been on the north side, but I climbed from the Nepal. Paul side previously, um, but uh, to, to watch her turn her dream into reality. And as that's as someone who didn't grow up identifying as a climber or an athlete or whatever, who has just been a part of it and adventurous and has, you know, trained to actually reach that with that growth mindset of saying that. So at Colin O'Brady on Instagram, my website, colinobrady.com for all my speaking, booking and stuff like that. And uh, go, go pick up the book. I think you'll enjoy it. It's uh, incredible. Congratulations. And um very, very, very a quick read and also super powerful for human potential. So thanks a lot for being on the show, but yeah, thank really you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, man. All right, folks at home. And again, oh, that's my phone hitting the ground. <laughs> or nope. We're breaking stuff. Have a great one. I'll see you again tomorrow.